The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. Welcome again. This is the second teaching in this series of uh, videos on the subject of the Feast of Israel. And as I said, the Feast of Israel reveal God's plan of redemption and the timeline of that plan. There's a number of reasons why the Feast of Israel can be somewhat confusing. But first of all, I'd like to divide them into two very simple categories which they naturally fall into. The Feast of Israel, of which I'm speaking of the original seven feasts, and there are two additional feasts which have been added to the Jewish calendar. Um, because of the work of Esther with uh, Mordecai, when the Jews were delivered of the uh, evil that Haman was doing, which is all recorded in the book of uh, Esther, that they instituted a feast called the Feast of Purim, which is also called the Feast of Lots. We're not going to go into that feast because it's not one of the seven original feasts. And then later there was a time where there was a, a, a group of individuals called the Maccabees and they helped uh, throw off some of the oppression that the Jewish people were uh, experiencing under the, the Romans and they instituted the Feast of uh, Hanukkah which most Christians are familiar because the Jewish Feast of Hanukkah falls around the time where we would be celebrating Christmas. So we're not going to be talking about Purim and we're not going to be talking about Hanukkah. So just to be clear, we're talking about the seven original feasts of Israel. These were feasts which God had delivered instructions to Moses and they are part of the Levitical law. Now those seven original feasts can be divided into two groupings. We have the spring feasts and we have the fall feasts. And in the spring feast, there's four. And those four, the first three happen very rapidly, all literally within a period of one week. There's the very first feast, which is Passover, followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then we have the Feast of First Fruits. Fifty days later, we have the Feast of Weeks. Most people understand it to be the Feast of Pentecost. Then we go through the, uh, the, through the end of spring and summer and we get into the fall and there's a period where nothing happens. And then when, as we get into fall, then we have three final feasts. There's the Feast of, of Trumpets, followed by the Day of Atonement, and then the last feast is the Feast of Booths. And that makes seven feasts. So they fall again into two categories, spring feast and fall feast. We have Passover, Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Pentecost, then we have the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Which leads me right into the next uh, thing that I wanted to mention. There's confusion, because even as I mentioned these feasts, you will notice how I mentioned a couple different names for the same event. And that therein is one of the reasons why there's confusion. But one of the main reasons there's confusion, or what I would say a lack of knowledge, possibly ignorance in the Christian uh, body concerning the Feast of Israel, is because we need to remember that in the 300s, in the mid 300s, there was a very concerted effort by Christian leadership to separate Christianity from its Jewish roots. This was an intentional move. The Christian leadership had pretty much gotten to the point where Jews were considered the enemy. After all, in their thinking, the Jews were the ones who killed Jesus. And so they wanted nothing to do with Judaism. It was an, uh, an anti-Semitic movement, anti-Zionistic movement, nothing to do with uh, Judaism. So they s intentionally separated and severed Christianity from the root. And the root being, uh, you know, our Judaistic roots. You know, after all, Jesus was a Jew. I was having a conversation with a, a, a friend of mine the other day, and, you know, we, we had to be reminded that, you know, Jesus is not a Christian. Jesus is a Jew. Not only was, he still is. You know, we're Christians because we're followers of Christ, but Jesus is 
is a Jew and was and still is. And so we have lost this connection with our Jewish roots, and so therefore it has produced ignorance concerning the feasts. Another reason why there's confusion on the feasts is because when we read them, they're mentioned in multiple books. We have them mentioned in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and then there's also references throughout the Bible. And because these feasts often go by multiple names, then it causes confusion because it's like, well, wait a minute, I thought it was the Feast of, of, of Weeks, but they're calling it the Feast of Booths, and he's referring to it as the Feast of Tabernacles. It's all the same event. And so that can cause confusion. We can also get into the New Testament and see that they make a reference to the fast, but we don't realize that the fast is really a reference to the feast, which is the Day of Atonement. So because of this, and then also because of the multiple activities that happen during these feasts, then that can cause confusion. After all, there are wave offerings, there's blood offerings, there's burnt offerings, there's all different types of days and there's there's you know bringing bread without yeast and then on another one there's bringing bread with yeast and it just gets confusing. I'm not going to go into the particulars of the feasts of all of the various types of offerings. You know to do that that would be quite extensive and that's available if you want to learn that you can read you know your own Bible and also there's some great works that are out there that you can uh, get familiar with. And by the way, I would like to make a reference to the fact that, you know, I'm, I've done my research through the uh, various authors. I like to say that I'm able to stand on the shoulders of someone who's gone before me and someone who has done a lot of this work. One of the books that I highly recommend is this book, which is uh, produced by uh, Michael Norton, and it's called Unlocking the Secrets of the Feast. Great book, it's a thin book, simple read. But um, I found that Michael really, really hits it well on a number of the, um, the details of the feast. And another one is this book, which is written by uh, Sa Sam Nadler. I believe Sam uh, is a rabbi, and it's called Messiah in the Feast of Israel. And uh, Sam has a, a great perspective on, on that. Uh, he's a Messianic uh, uh, Jew, meaning that as a uh, as a Jew, he has accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. I have another one here which is called Celebrating Jesus in the Biblical Feast by Dr. Booker. And then the last book that um, I would recommend, and of course there's many others that are out there, you can do your own research. And all these books are easily available on Amazon. Um, and here's a book and it's called The Feasts of the Lord by Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. Now. Um, one of the reasons that I like this book is because it has lot, lots of pictures and diagrams. You can see I've got my highlights in there. And it, it just gives you a real flavor for, you know, some of the things that are happening. Um, one of the last points that I'd like to mention here as an overview before we get into the specifics of the feast is as we approach the feast, we have to remember that the feasts are actually prophetic foreshadows. Now I've done a previous teaching or a series of teachings on the topic of prophetic foreshadows and I would recommend that you listen to that um, so that you understand what a prophetic foreshadow is. But very simply, a prophetic or a foreshadow, before we even get into prophetic, let's just talk about a foreshadow. A foreshadow is a literary device. It's a legitimate device that authors use when developing a plot. And what they'll do is they'll write the story and then they give you some details or some, something that will arrest your attention to bring uh, a greater detail or emphasis later in the script. It's, it to helps them to develop the plot. A prophetic foreshadow is something that God has done in his word where he describes an event but then that event really is is the point of it is something future concerning Jesus Christ for instance God spoke of Joseph and he describes the relationship of Joseph and Pharaoh but really the point of that story is the relationship of Jesus Christ in a future time with God you know, in the relationship Jesus Christ has to God as the same as Joseph to Pharaoh. God does this with people, places, things, and events. 
and the feasts of Israel are the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest events that God has done to give us foreshadows that point to the work of Christ and details of it. And then they, when they happen, they should draw our attention and we, we stand back and go, oh my gosh, what God was talking about in the Feast of Passover, look at how Jesus Christ literally is the fulfillment of that event. Think of the feasts as appointed times. In Hebrew, it's the word moed, singular, moedim, plural. We translate it as feast, but it literally means the appointed time. Now, when you think about it in that, in that regard, that means that what God is doing through the, through the year with regards to, you know, what, you know, think of it as a holiday, the feast is a holiday, but yet these are really having a greater reference or a parallel to something in overall arching history of mankind. And that's what the, uh, the feasts of Israel are. If we go to Colossians chapter 2, and it would be really good if you have a Bible to turn to that because, you know, you need to see this in the Bible for yourself. Don't just take my opinion or someone else's opinion concerning anything that anybody teaches. Go to the Word of God and read it yourself. Um, as a side note, I found that many times people make references to things, but they're pulling something out of context or whatever. So, you know, please take the time. Go there yourself. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival literally should be a religious feast because see we're talking here about Israel's feast goes on and says a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day now when I read this years ago what the heck they're talking about a new moon celebration that almost seemed paganistic to me, you know, celebrating the moon or something, but it, n not at all. What we need to understand is the Hebrews, their calendar, the way they would mark a month, it was by looking for the moon. And a new moon is when that you, the, the moon is totally dark and then you see the very first sliver of that moon appearing. That's a new moon. And they needed to know when that new moon was so that they would know when the month would begin. And once they would know the month, they could count the number of months, then they could count the number of days within the month. And it was all very essential for them to know this in order for them to celebrate the feast that God said, you will celebrate it on either the first day or the 14th day or the 15th day. Well, if I'm supposed to celebrate a feast on the first day of the month, I've got to be watching for this first sliver of light to know that this is the first day of the month. And that, in fact, is exactly what the Hebrews did in Israel. They had elaborate systems for determining when that first moon would appear. And if it's cloudy in Jerusalem, they're not going to know. So they even would have situations in the Negev or En Gedi and spread out throughout all of Israel. And then they would have ways of communicating that so they would know exactly at the temple when the first day of the month was and then they could begin counting. So here in Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 it says, Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious feast, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath. Now, that's not necessarily just the weekly Sabbath, which is the seventh day of rest every week. But this also is a reference to the feast, because every feast is a Sabbath too. It's a high holy day. And it goes on in verse 17 and it says, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is in Christ. And that's my point. The feasts are a shadow. They're a prophetic foreshadow that speak or point to the reality that is in Jesus Christ. See, as we begin to gain an understanding of the feasts, we're going to have whole sections of Scripture that will unlock to us with greater meaning and significance. As an example, consider Acts chapter 12, verse 3. It says, when, when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, as we get into this study, you will see exactly when the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. What's the significance of this? Why would, why would uh, you know, they want to seize Peter right during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? And also, Acts chapter 20, verse 6, 
It says, but when we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So now we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 6, there's a reference to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when you know and understand when that feast occurs during the year, then all of a sudden you have a time marker. You know exactly what Paul is talking about and you know exactly you know, uh, when it was that they set sail. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we'll see that the feasts apply to us in the New Testament. These are just not Old Testament occurrences. These things actually do apply to us in the sense of gaining meaning and understanding. For, because it says in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Now, if you don't understand Passover and all the significance of Passover, you don't really have as much insight as possible into what that single verse there alone means. You know, it says Christ is your Passover, but if you don't know that and understand all of the meaning behind that and what that potentially can, can um, uh, you know, imply and its significance, then you've just missed it. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, there is a feast called the Feast of First Fruits, and that feast has tremendous uh, application to us in the sense of its significance when we understand what does it mean when Je it says Jesus is the first fruits. Well, to gain that understanding, we have to understand the Feast of First Fruits and all that God said it meant and, and what the Hebrews you know, understood it to be. There's even a, a verse in uh, John chapter 20, verse 17, where after Jesus um, rises from the dead and, uh, you know, the, the next morning Mary comes to the garden and she sees the gardener and then she realizes it's Jesus and Jesus says, well, Mary, don't touch me. Well, just even that simple phrase, don't touch me, when you understand the Feast of first fruits and that Jesus needed to remain clean so that he could present himself in the temple to God as the first fruits, that then all of a sudden, just that simple phrase begins to give us greater understanding. So remember that the, the word feast, it should be more properly be understood as the appointed times. And that word in, in Hebrew, moed or moedim in plural, you know, that's a whole other word study. But when we talk about the feasts, we're actually talking about God's appointed times, how God has revealed his plan of redemption, the appointed times on how God is going to accomplish his plan. So that's, this session, session was intended to be a little bit of an overview. We've got a few more things to understand concerning you know, calendars and stuff. We'll do that in the next session and then we're going to get into the meat of the feasts of Israel. <music>